Um, my name is Kayla Salinsky. I am head of school at Macbeth Academy, www.macbethacademy.org. And today we have so Star Saxstein. Um, she's a prolific author, and we're going to talk about her book that's coming out of March 23rd. She is a nationally board certified teacher, and she's an education consultant that believes in empowering kids with um, self-assessments and just learning how to empower educators and administrators to focus less on the grade and more on the actual student. So um, without further ado, Star Saxstein, thank you so much for being here. And um, yes, so first I wanted to talk to about your like three, three books, right? The two books that you're well known for, Hacking Assessment, 10 Ways to Go Gradeless in a Traditional Grade School. And then your other book that most of your fans know you for is Teaching Students to Self-Assess. How do I help students reflect and grow as learners? So we'll talk about those two books. And then I also wanted to talk to you about um, your new book coming out March 23rd. Check it out. It's Assessing with Respect, which a lot of teachers don't really know anything about. So um, in this conversation, let's start with Hacking Assessment. How do teachers and admins go gradeless in a traditional grade school? How do we do it? Um, I think the first most important thing is you have to break the status quo because something about a grading system is kind of ingrained in us because the system expects that you get a grade at the end of everything that you do. Like that's what signifies that you've done it and you've been communicated how well you've done on it. Um, but what I learned over the time that I was in the classroom was that those grades seldom actually represented what kids knew and could do. Uh, my best efforts to make it that way, but there are so many things that we end up counting or not counting that ends up really moving away from the point. And, and it always starts kind of with teacher clarity. What is the point of this assessment that I'm trying to right. learn about with kids? And then... I know as an English teacher, something I was often very guilty of is even though I may have been assessing one thing, there were all these other things that started to play into what that final grade looked like. like uh, and for example, if it was turned in late, that right. points off. Or um, as an English teacher, if I was looking to see how well a student was able to communicate their understanding of a book, I started ripping apart how well they communicated those ideas, grammar and different things that may not have been on the rubric at the time that then became um, almost too big of a factor instead of really just focusing on do the kids understand what they're reading. Right. And over time, I kind of learned that developing really targeted formative tasks that aligned with the standards and skills I needed students to know Mm -hmm. I could then really, really, really zero in on the specific things I needed to be assessing and only assess those things at the time that I was doing it mm -hmm. in terms of levels of mastery, not in terms of grades. So, yeah. so I remember when we were talking and I said, was this a system wide change or was this just in your classroom? Because what happens is that we're all different teachers, especially now during COVID, it's all online. So how do we uh, avoid having one rock star teacher that's doing all these wonderful revolutionary things? How do we how to make this sustainable and scalable for the whole school? You need to have a really inspired leader that mm. kind of makes that happen. I was doing it alone as a teacher. I had a couple of colleagues who were curious and would peek their head in because Kids never left my classroom, honestly. Like, I had kids in my space. At first, they were like, no grades. They won't want to, you know, no kid's going to try if you don't give them grades. I was like, you know, I bet oh, yeah. you know, They stay. They do the work. They see the value in the work because we yeah. develop the work together. Right. Um, by the time I was getting ready to leave the school I was at the longest, the students were co-constructing the curriculum with me. They were developing Whoa. assessments with me. Um, and it, all it took was me letting my ego take a side seat to what was going on, understanding that this was something we needed to do together because it wasn't about my learning. It was about their learning experience um, and really giving them opportunities to step up and own it by, you know, if I said, all right, these are the objectives we need to be able to do by the end of this unit, how best should we do that? Here are your options. If you have better ideas, I'm open. You know, bring it. 
You want to work together as a team. And like, even by, by the last one, I think I mentioned this in our earlier conversation about mm. the Hamlet unit, which always right. stays with me. I gave them my entire unit. I broke them up into groups and I said, you do better. And wow. the group had an opportunity to develop a project they felt would meet the same expectations, cover the same standards. And then I was like, and if you can't come up with something better, you could default to what's there already. Right. We'll vote as a class, which one you like the best. And then whichever group gets the most votes, I'll work with that group to develop an actual assignment, come up with a rubric, look at benchmarks. And, you know, you'll help me steer the class in the direction that you need to go. And sure enough, this young, this, this group of four young ladies uh -huh. came up with this amazing idea to do this um, psychoanalysis of characters <laughs> um, for Hamlet. What grade is this? 12. This was 12. This is my yeah, so I mean, Amazing. we were already looking at different um, critical theories and looking at characters in different ways. But I mean, they ended up having to do research on the character coming up, like going deep dives into the text to be able to determine what their psychosis was, what kind of remedy goes with that psychosis. And then they had to create a video that showed, that showed you know, the the trajectory of healing, I guess, for that particular character that was, the, the only criteria was that they couldn't change the text. Like your character can't live on if your character commits suicide. Um, you know, you have to make sure you stick with the narrative as Shakespeare wrote it. Um, so the, I've, I'm just getting, my brain is just like firing because I'm like, first, oh, I know that there's going to be a question, well, we, our school is small or our school doesn't have that much funding or our kids aren't, you know, it's not like a college, um, how do I say this? Our kids are smart, you know what I mean? What is you know what I mean? Like, oh, your kids are more advanced. Maybe it's the private school, probably. Like, tell me the con the context of New these kids. Public school. Mm -hmm. um, we did not have prereqs for people to be an AP, just a willingness, so the gates were not closed. Nice. I would say in the 34 kids I had in that class, by traditional standards, maybe 10 of them were actually AP students. The wow. rest you know, I would say some were below grade level, so, but you have a, re I had a reputation in that school. Most seniors, despite the usual kind of um, stereotype of kids not wanting to do work in their senior year, right. they wanted to be ready for college. And I had the reputation of being able to do that. So wow. I always had a waiting list for kids to come into that class. And, um, and I was happy to help any kid who wanted to be in there, regardless of their level, because it wasn't about what they came to me knowing. It was about mm -hmm. how much progress we could make in the time we were together. That's amazing. That's, that's amazing. So that's the purpose of the, the assessment kind of whittles down to, I'm hearing, yes, break the status quo, get student buy-in. Yes. Right? Yes. And you'll need to, let me tell you, especially if you're working with um, your higher level kids, they're the ones who are going to resist getting rid of grades the most. Right. You're less academically inclined by the status quo are going to mm. be the ones that are going to own it the most. Wow. Um, because honestly, between me and all your listeners, mm. a lot of times our brightest kids are the ones who don't play the game of school very well. I know that. And so when you decide that your classroom is not going to be about a game, but it's going to be about learning, mm. those kids who are intrinsically motivated to learn and curious are going to are going to find a way to engage with what you're asking. And if you notice they're not doing the work, ninety percent of the time it's because something else is going on. So you need wow. to engage in a dialogue and ask them what they want to be doing, and yes. then find a way to accommodate them. You know, yes. like, I know that teachers will say, well, then, you know, what if the rigor of what they're choosing isn't on the same level as what we're expecting? And, and mm. I will venture to say that what they come up with will blow you away. Ask and listen. That's the best. Ask and listen. I think of now, like, especially with COVID, but in the online space, I'm seeing students less as teacher centered, more student centered and thinking of them as like employees even, or as 
team members versus top down. And if you use strategies like get their buy-in, have them give them ownership of the classroom, it's more meaningful to them. And they're just, they're children, but they're people, they're humans. Yes. Having ownership gives value. We're just trying to keep the kids from dropping out or not seeing value. It all comes down to that. And then can you talk to me more about, um, so breaking status quo, getting student buy-in, what, how do we, I'm trying to think of like, how do teachers st standardize, not standardize, but how do we kind of replicate in your English class is wonderful. What about STEM? What about uh, an elective? What, you know, like, how do I, how do I re repeat this process? So, I mean, the way that I would think about it is small pieces, anything that you could shift to, to problem-based or project-based learning in lieu of testing, like okay. direct testing, you could do that in any class, um, not just in humanities-based classes. And anytime, like I, I work with a consultant, Lori Cook, who is like the math guru, and she could make math interesting to anyone. Um, yeah, you see that? That was my expression the first time I met her too, where she's like, it's all real world problems yeah. where the math we're learning applies directly to life. So she focuses wow. on the math practices instead of math problems and computation necessarily. So it's about understanding that to do math well, you have to make a lot of mistakes and that's just a part of the process. Right. Uh, and so there, there are definitely ways to do this kind of work in every content area. It's about seeing things, again, differently than we've always done them. Right. No them more different. skill and drilling, no more reading from a textbook and answering questions. But, right. you know, after you've read the textbook, you're going to actually synthesize your learning and do something with it. Do something with it. And then you're not going to have that question of, why am I learning this? It, and that's What's, the thing. The why has to be transparent right. and, and clearly communicated to kids before they start. Before they start. Absolutely. That's brilliant. But what if, if the teacher doesn't know the why, and you can't and, learn in the middle. And, and that's that, what you, you just hit the nail on the head. A lot of times, and I will honestly admit that there were plenty of times I was in the classroom that I didn't have clarity. Mm. And the evidence of that was when I got student work back and it didn't look anything like what I was expecting. Wow. My directions weren't clear or, you know, I said one thing one day and then I said something different another day. And, wow. you know, my expectations adjusted as we went through the process and I never clearly communicated that to kids. How fair is that for me to then assess them based on something that I wasn't even really sure of? So, I mean, that's the other thing. Teachers get clear on what and why you're doing what you're doing. Right. And then, you know, that's why reflection and self-assessment are paramount to this understanding as well, because even if we create the most amazing assessment, mm -hmm. there's always gaps of things that kids know that our assessment didn't assess. So by giving them an opportunity to reflect on their learning from the experience and fill in those gaps, mm -hmm. we have a much better understanding of what they actually took away from a learning unit than just what our assessment asked them to do. And then, you know, it's wonderful. It's like it was planned because this goes perfectly into teaching students to self-assess your other book. How do I help students reflect and grow as learners? Can we talk more about that? Like, what does that process look like? Um, so... As much as people want to think that reflection is this innate thing we do as human beings, it's just mm. not. Like we might think about our day or we might decide if we like something or not like something. Mm -hmm. But to academically reflect is a whole other skill set with metacognition that actually needs to be directly taught. We have to model it for kids um, in our own behaviors and actions. We need to scaffold the process so that our expectations are clearly aligned with their understanding. And then mm -hmm. we have to give them lots of feedback on the reflections that they're doing. So mm -hmm. I had a, a multi-step process, usually even with my ninth grade students, um, which was also a mixed class of L's special ed. And so for your teachers who are like, she only worked with 12th grade honors students. Right. To work with ninth grade mixed students without a co-teacher because journalism, although it was a writing class, 
right. wasn't considered a main. So I was on yeah. my own with kids with a lot of needs. Um, what you need to do is scaffold the process. So the first paragraph of a reflection, you heard me, the first paragraph. So this is a full writing piece. It's not wow. um, a sentence or a paragraph or answering questions. Although if you're in the grade school aspect, that yeah. is where you'd start. You'd ask them a question and you'd ask them to reflect. But by middle school and high school, they should be able to write a full written reflection. Okay. First paragraph, what did this assignment ask me to do? And in their own words, they're going to tell you what they thought they were supposed to do. And here's the rub, right? This is why it's so important. We then assess them based on what they thought they were supposed to do and not on what we expected them to do. That's interesting. Um, and then the lens through which you see their work is really specific to whether or not they were successful doing what they were supposed to do hmm. through their eyes. And when you have all of these things in place as well, they have set their own goals. So the feedback you provide them could be aligned with the goals that they set. And each kid gets differentiated feedback, which then also differentiates the instruction because you're going to be doing strategic feedback along the way based on their specific needs. Okay. I, what's, for example, right? I've got 20 kids in my class. How do I do that? I'm going to teach 20 different ways? No. Okay. <laughs> How do I do Because this is not made for just the one-on-one -on -one set. I, this is brilliant because it can go, it, it's teaching to the child, teaching to, you know, what they need, but you don't have to make 20 different lesson plans. So what's the, what's the, um, how do we differentiate? Base level, like this is what I need to teach kind mm. of lesson. And you start there because we all want to start exactly where we think we need to be. Right. Then you start getting these indicators back from kids about where they actually are and where you need to lean in and teach into, right? So if you're doing a project-based situation, you teach a mini lesson, and then you're doing a workshop-style class where mm. you're going around, you're listening in the small groups. And you, you really want to do small group projects with groups because that's where they're going to do their practice. They're going to lean on each other. That's the formative process. You will never grade a grouped project ever again. Mm. Never, ever. Because you just don't know who's responsible for that learning. You could give them tons of feedback. You could say what elements worked really well. But the second part to every project that you're doing with groups is an independent written assignment or other product that asks them to apply the skills they learned in that group project so that That's good. you could really make sure that the assessment you're giving to each individual kid, which is also why reflection is so important because if you're in a group, you could talk about what your contribution was. Um, you could certainly um, dissuade them from talking about group members who didn't pull their weight. Um, only, yeah. only focus on the portion of the learning that they did and what they took away from that experience. Awesome. And the differentiation then comes in the feedback that you pr provide. So we all know we spend tons of time putting feedback on work. Rather than just cutting and pasting the same feedback on every single assignment, mm -hmm. really understand where each kid needs to be and then focus on those things. If you have a kid who has, is really struggling and there's big issues like organization or lack of development, you can't go into transitions and diction and vocabulary if they have bigger issues. Right. The content's not even right. So you need to make sure that you're hitting where they are and you're all, like you don't want to overwhelm them with feedback. You only want to make sure that you're giving them what they need at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And then you're giving them time to practice before you go in to assess them again. So how, how do we make sure we don't, you know, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Well, I was thinking, how do we make sure I don't overwhelm them? From, um, yeah. From my so perspective, what do you think? Um, if you start to write on a student piece product and you mm. notice you are writing more than they have written, you're going to overwhelm them. Yeah. Um, and it does, um, e even though you want to tell them everything they did right and wrong, that does no one any good. What I would recommend is if you see them making the same mistake repeatedly, mention it once or twice, and then say, I want you to go through the rest of your paper 
and look for this specific thing, trying this new strategy. Nice. Mark it up every single time because that will be a demoralizing moment for them to see what that looks like. Absolutely. Especially that. I remember getting papers like that uh, in math and it was so much red pen. It's just kind of made, I've lost sight of what I was doing wrong and it's just like, oh, I'm not smart. Yeah, and that's and, and that's actually the perfect segue into the book that I just wrote. Yes. That is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Right. Every single child is smart in their own way. Yes. And our job as educators is to figure out what way that is. And instead of doing the deficit style teaching that most of us are accustomed to, where we're telling them where they're wrong all the time and telling them how to fix it, yeah. Find the thing they're good at and we strengthen from what they're good at. Excellent. So that we make them feel good, we lift them up, we, melt, we help them feel confident as learners. Yeah. And then as they're, as they're being lifted on their strengths, we start to layer in underneath that the stuff that they need to continue to work on by pairing them with kids whose strength might be where their challenge is. Where, where there's a balance and it's not so much like you have one strong kid working with a kid who's so far below them that that kid who's far below knows that they're the 2T and the other one is the teacher. Right. What a crappy dynamic to be a part of. Absolutely. So I just want to kind of be super clear. March 23rd, assessing with respect everyday practices that meet student social emotional needs. So we, there's so much focus right now on SEL, SEL. It's like a buzzword. But you, what you're talking about is actually incorporating SEL in a very meaningful way when it comes to assessment. So kind of walk us through, where do we start? Relationships. Okay. You know, you've got to know your kids really well and they have to trust you. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to design assessments that play to kids' strengths, you've got to know their strengths. Yes. And that means you need to take an interest in every single child in your space. And you need to find what excites them and use that, exploit it in everything that you do in the classroom. Um, oh, I love it. I believe in that too. We do student interest inventories. Nice. The first class student interest inventory. What do you like? What don't you like? I like Legos. And this is an English class. What, or I like Minecraft. Some parents are like, oh, well, they like Minecraft. Well, let's write and teach me about my, I don't know anything about that. Let's write an instru- informative essay about how to play this thing in Minecraft. And they, you can't get them to stop writing. So that's what they love. Minds with Minecraft here. I had a student in my in my English class actually make a movie in Minecraft Whoa. about about a Christmas Carol, Dickens, like a satire movie in Minecraft with his group about literature. That's beautiful. Boom. Yeah, my mind is blown. Yeah, <laughs> it's because so, it, it's and it's um, it's like a because diff- that same kid probably would have been like oh a five paragraph essay on why should schools be open versus I'm just gonna make this cinematic masterpiece about something that I absolutely love. Yeah, which by the way takes so much more effort and so much more understanding than writing a five paragraph essay. I know. So first, relationships know their strengths. Yes. How do I do that in the online? I'm, I'm thinking is in terms of like I'm a public school teacher. You know, New York City school public schools are closed. We're all doing remote learning. I'm new to the space. How do I get to know my kids? Like I said, the first thing, like the first few classes can't really be about this is what you have to do to get a grade. They have to be mm. about what's going on at home. Um, how best do you learn? What do you need from me to be successful? Oh. Right. Um, and then checking in on them, you know, like whether it's in a private chat, in an email, you know, whatever works for you. I know some people aren't comfortable. Like um, I was a newspaper advisor at my school. So the kids that were in my newspaper had my cell phone number for when we were doing layout or when we were going to publication. They, they knew how to get in touch with me, mm-hmm. not just through the normal venues. But not everybody's comfortable with that. And I get it. Right. So you don't have to go that far. But you might want to set up a professional social media account that they could contact you through. Maybe okay. you do extra help on Twitter or on a Facebook Live. Go where they are. If they're doing TikTok, you go do TikTok. Find a way to make them see that you're trying to meet them where they are wow. instead of forcing them to come to you. That's brilliant. 
And then, so build relationships, professional social media, which is a very 21st century, like virtual way to get in touch with the kids. What else do we do after building relationships? Um, so, I mean, the way that the book is broken down, it uses mm -hmm. Castle's, free, um, Castle's framework for um, the core competencies. Okay. So the second chapter is all about um, self-regulation, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about, we, there's a whole section on learning dispositions. There's a section on reflection and self-assessment. Mm -hmm. And so that piece is getting their voice involved in what's going on in the design of what we're doing and then in the assessment of what we're doing. Excellent. And just making sure that they understand who they are as learners so that they can best tell us what they need. And there's a, an advocacy part in that as well for them to really teach them how to ask for help when they need it. This is excellent. <laughs> I'm so inspired because you know, as we were just talking about this, especially you know, check out... Um, Star Sexton's uh, TED Talks is a wonderful TED Talk about being that kid where all of their value was put on grades and you are totally revolutionizing that concept, grading with respect, having children self-assess. It's just revolutionary and so needed right now, especially in the online space where we're, we're going into a personalized education world. So how do we do that? So before we end, I'd love to just hear for the teachers out there that are going to remote learning, for the first time and they don't really know how assessments work, what would be your parting feedback for them or tip for them? Um, again, if you're ever going to try not grading, now's the time to not grade. Mm. Your kids are going to need a lot of grace the same way you need a lot of grace. Um, think about your worst day since this pandemic started. How was your focus? How was your ability to attend? How motivated did you feel? Honestly, when I actually wrote this book this year, it took me months just to get started. And that's usually writing's my jam. So like it was a little frightening to be in a situation where the thing that came most naturally and most easily to me wasn't coming at all. And I was terrified that I would never get it back again. So like the reality is that the human beings we work with on the other side of the computer mm -hmm. are just that human beings, just like us. And maybe they have family members who had COVID. Maybe they've experienced loss. Someone died. Um, maybe they, a parent lost a job and now they're struggling financially. Like those are major things that make learning really hard. Right. Because there are more pressing matters, you know, Maslow knew this a long time ago, when those basic needs aren't being met, how can you expect a kid to learn in the same way as when all of their needs are being met? Wow. So just use that empathy that you all have, that compassion, and, you know, know your kids, know their needs, and give them lots of, lots of grace having deadlines and putting extra anxiety on them to do things one way isn't going to get the results you hope it's going to. So just be flexible and be empathetic. That's the best advice I can give right now. On this. Yes. And read your book, Assessing with Respect, coming out March 23rd. If you want Amazon, I'm going to read it. So thank you, Star. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Thank you for being a revolutionary creative educator. And thank you for your time. This is excellent. You're awesome. So <laughs> you're awesome. <laughs> All right. See you. Thank you. And you can come uh, if you like this video, subscribe to our Macbeth Academy channel and um, visit www.macbethacademy.org. This is Kayla Slinsky, and I will see you next Thursday at seven o'clock. Bye. Bye, everyone.